Hey, I'm Jared Potter, and today we're going to be talking about designing for Windows Phone 101. Uh, I am a UX designer and developer, and for the last three years, I was one of the design integration leads in the mobile studio at Microsoft, designing Windows Phone and a couple other projects. Uh, for the last couple of months, I've been the principal designer at 6 Ave Studios, and you can always reach me on Twitter at Jared T. Potter or LinkedIn at Jared T. Potter. This presentation is a series, it's part of a series of design that's talking about Windows Phone 8. First, we're going to be talking about the high-level question of what is design. Next, we'll be discussing the Windows design language, uh, next design-driven product, Windows Phone 8 features, and then lastly, we'll be talking about the whole up Windows ecosystem that Windows Phone 8 is a part of. The first thing that we'll talk about today is what is design. There are many definitions for design. A lot of different people think about it in different ways. In a lot of ways, the difference between art and design is a question of intent and intended audience. But really, one of the things that I regularly heard coming in the design studio is, is mobile design necessary? And is this app that I'm working on, is it necessary for me to spend the time and the resources on design? And sometimes that came from people who were just working on simple things like a productivity application or a scheduling application that didn't seem like something that would really have a, create, uh, a huge impact if they added a lot of time and resources and budget to the user experience. Uh, and I love this quote that comes from Douglas Martin in a book about design. Uh, a practical introduction. It says, questions about whether design is necessary or affordable are quite beyond, beside the point. Design is inevitable. The alternative to good design is bad design, uh, not no design at all. Another quote that I love is from the uh, documentary Helvetica, and this is from the famous author or designer Mosimo Vignelli, who designed a couple things like the American Airlines logo as well as the New York City subway map. And he says this in his broken English, uh, life of the designer is a life of fight. Fight against the ugliness. Just like a doctor fights against disease, for us, visual disease uh, is what we have around and what we try as a designer to cure with design. One of the things, stories that calls to mind when you're talking about design um, is the gardens at Versailles. And I remember hearing this story from a good friend of mine, a designer, named Robbie Ingebretson, who went out there, and a couple of years ago, I had the chance to go out there with a few friends, and he showed this picture uh, to another friend who said, what do you think about this? Isn't this beautiful? And their reaction right off the bat was, yeah, it's so cool and simple. And if you've ever been out to the gardens at Versailles, you'll know one thing right off the bat. It's not simple. It covers over 2,000 acres, and there's different types of plants and gardens spread out all over the place. The main thing that makes this feel simple, and when you first look at this design, is that it's given order. Every single different object has been placed in a specific location, and that order comes across to the human eye as simplicity. This is the job for many, many different designers in many different roles. For a stylist or a fashion designer, it may be taking all kinds of different materials and putting them in such an order that you see the design and it feels simple and it feels beautiful. For an architect, it may be like using a location or using all kinds of building materials. For the graphic designer, it may be something like a menu or supplemental facts about you know, ingredients. Uh, for us, on a Windows Fine design, it was more than just putting a calendar and a map and a clock and books together on a device. When you're working on a mobile app, you're thinking about a lot of different things. You're thinking about business requirements, research, schedule, the design language, market analysis, and of course, technical limitations of the devices that you'll be working on. If you can take all of those and put them in an order that sim feels simple, it goes like this quote, design is the conscious effort to impose meaningful order. And that's a beautiful quote by Victor Papanek, but what it really means is that when you put that device in your hand for the very first time, it feels simple, it feels beautiful, and it feels easy to use. Uh, Alex White once said this, to design means to plan. The process of design is used to bring order from chaos and randomness. A couple of things that I like to go back to when I'm trying to bring order to a lot of different requirements is use order to create the appearance of simplicity. Uh, this can be used in many different ways, but the, one of the easiest ways to approach this is just manage the relationships, not the elements. When you're laying out a page for the very first time, it's really easy to just take everything and lay it out in a visually beautiful way. In a lot of ways, that's graphic design and not interface design. In interface design, you need to think about the tabs that correlate to the content so that they'll realize where they're at in the hierarchical navigation structure. 
if anything, it feels out of order. It may not be long. So do not be afraid to remove disconnected content. In the design studio, when we were moving from Windows Mobile 6 to Windows Phone 7, a lot of the project managers took on, took on the role and the title of fierce reducer of elements. We had all these great features, but they weren't necessarily a great goal for the end feature. And so what we ended up doing is saying, is this necessary? Is that necessary? And pulling out elements out until we got to the absolute final beautiful design that we needed to work with. In a lot of ways, we see that design is order. The next point I'd like to make is that design is problem solving. Uh, at Microsoft, we had a team basically dedicated uh, to doing user research. And uh, one of my favorite stories in the design studio was when she was testing an old product, it actually made one of the user participants cry when they'd held it. And I won't say which product it is, but you can see the frustration that people get when they start working on these. A lot of these, these frustrations and little dead ends that come from working on an application can be removed by just using common sense. So common sense says that whenever I talk to someone or I have a history of talking to someone, I should be able to look up on my phone what they said in an email or a text or a voicemail or all of these different things. A lot of devices don't allow you to see all of those in one area. So we started thinking about it and on a contact card on Windows Phone, we put those all in one location so that you can look at it and see everything, whether it came from text or Facebook or an SMS. Uh, this seemed like an easy feature to pull off. It was actually quite difficult, but it just made sense. So we put the time and effort into creating it. Another example of that uh, is the browser search bar. Uh, in Internet Explorer, on the very first version of Windows Phone, we kind of got it wrong. We put it up at the top of the browser, and after some user research study, we found that it was difficult to hit, and it wasn't consistent with the rest of the product where the application bar was nested at the bottom of the UI. We moved it down to the bottom with a little bit of common sense talking about it, uh, and it ended up working out great. So one, a couple of my points about problem solving is think outside the box and use a little bit of common sense. It's a weird thing to say in a presentation to use common sense, but when you're thinking about all kinds of requirements like hardware, budgets, and timeline, sometimes the last thing on your mind is actually the common sense that a user would use when they're trying to approach your product. The last thing I'd like to say is design is empathy. In the design studio, we have a, a, a studio playbook that said the end user is king. Uh, it basically, the point of this was to say that whoever is going to be, end up holding the phone in their hand is the most important person in the design process. It's the person we think about all the time. It said this, the consumer decides we're helping to elevate Microsoft product experiences to be more relevant, to be more emotionally connected, and to be there for our customers' needs with real solutions. We need to listen and empathize with real customers, become the advocate. We will prioritize our work to make sure that we deliver the best possible experience to our customer. This quote comes from Debbie Millman in a book that she says, How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer. In the book, she interviews a ton of different famous graphic designers who have done amazing designs, and she says this about all of them. Many of the designers in this book describe design as a problem-solving activity, yet it's clear that these designers do far more than that. Despite the obvious similarities, there is one trait shared by each and every person in this group of designers, high levels of empathy. So one of the things that I would encourage any designer to do as they approach an application for the first time is flex your empathy muscle. Think about the end user first and get to know your user. In the design studio, we did this many different ways. We used personas, and personas are basically a made-up person that exemplifies a large target base. And you give that person a name and measure every single design against this person. Would Alex actually appreciate this? Would Alex actually use this? It seems like a great feature, but is it something that Alex actually needs? Another thing that we did in the design studio is a lot of user research study. We get real users in front of UI that we've designed. This is something that I would recommend for everyone. Get scrappy about it. Get your, you, get your designs in front of a user by any way po means possible. One of the ways that we would do it really uh, quick and dirty is quick draw out a UI, take a picture of it on a phone, put it in the, the Photos app, and then have someone click on it and say, can you go to the settings screen? And if they click the wrong place, you probably put it in the wrong place and you need to revisit your design. This is something that I would definitely recommend to any designers. You think that you have all the right answers as a designer, and I know this for a fact, 
but <laughs> for myself, speaking for myself. Uh, but until you get a design into someone in, fr in somebody else's hands, sometimes all your preconceived notions are a little bit off. That wraps up what is design for Windows Phone 8. Hi, I'm Jared Potter, and today we're going to be talking about uh, designing for Windows Phone 101. The section that we're talking about today is Windows Design Language, and you may have commonly heard this known as Metro. It is now Windows Design Language, and we will be talking about a couple different pieces of it. We'll be talking about the influence and inspiration that brought around the design language, and then a couple of the design principles that we measured every single screen against when creating Windows Phone 8. Our first step in building Metro was not to look at other phones or other computers or other pieces of software out there. Our, we basically stepped back and we looked, like, like to look at how users navigate information in their everyday activities. Our team had the inspiration of transportation graphics. Whether it's at Narita or JFK, these graphics are basically used to get someone from point A to pay, point B in a cross-cultural, cross-language, quick and direct type of way. They should be able to look at these from any point in the airport and see where they're going, where they're from, and where they're going to. We actually went out and took a lot of pictures of this. And you'll notice the iconography and simple, consistent typography across all these. Another piece that we looked at is some old art. Earlier in the presentation, I used Mosimo Vignelli and a quote from him. This is actually the Manhattan subway map that he designed and is a rather famous piece. But the goals, if you think about it, for a subway map are very similar to the, to the goals of a phone. Uh, when you get in the subway and you get in and the doors close, you hope that when they close, you end up in the right destination. The same with on our phone. When you press a tile, you hope that you end up in the right application or where you are trying to go. Also, uh, we started using really consistent systems that have been around since the beginning of time. Just very fundamentals in graphic design and visual design. We went back to the grid and really invested in a lot of time in the grid structure that would show on every single screen. And the grid has been around since handwritten books um, and really one of the very first things that you learn when you go to design school. Uh, it was used and broken with geometric designs that you would see in the Bauhaus movement. These are really timeless and ways to create order that comes across to the user like simplicity. Another thing that we used a lot of, and some of the things that are actually pretty cool right now, um, especially in the digital age that we're in, uh, is infographics. And infographics are all over the place, all around us. If you watch the Olympics, you would see some very important infographics kind of all over the walls, and they used them in their de design, as well as modern branding systems. A lot of these modern branding systems have only come out in the last couple of years, but really are using a timeless typographic style, as well as some of these older brands, like the American Airlines one, is the only major airline that hasn't changed its branding or style in the last 50 years. The other place that we looked to before we started working on actual physical screens was uh, to look inwardly and see what Microsoft is doing. One of the other goals with Windows Design Language to, was to help the mu movement that was happening across Microsoft to unify our products. So there was programmers out there unifying our code base so that we would have the same code on phones and tablets and on PCs. But we were doing the work that hopefully would unify us in a visual way so that the consumers would look at the products and say, this is one consistent company. Uh, one of the things we looked at was some of the cool design work that was coming out of Office. And this was their visions of the future and how you would interact with it. Media Center, you'll see the, that the content was beginning to bubble up to the top and it was about typography. They used motion graphics and this was one of the first teams at Microsoft that they actually had a full-time motion designer designing these graphics. The content bubbled up and less and less you stopped seeing as much chrome that was surrounding the content. It would just be about the content itself. Another product that made me fall in love with Microsoft Design for the very first time was the Zune product. As a matter of fact, uh, Jeff Fong, the creative director on Media Center, or who worked as a designer on Media Center and Zune, was the creative director on Windows Phone 8. And uh, Zune HD won a couple of IDEA awards and was also a really beautiful, beautiful physical hardware project that came out of Microsoft. Of course, we have Xbox. And you notice the content coming forward front and center, the bold use of tiles and color. And then, of course, we had the current existing state of mobile at Microsoft, which was Windows Mobile 6. 
And Windows Mobile 6 was kind of a fractured product. There were numerous manufacturers, carriers, resolutions, and languages that it supported. Um, and we saw how owners were starting to use their phone, not only the Windows Mobile phones at Microsoft, but other phones, either for the good or also in a lot of ways for the bad and their interactions in a day-to-day -day with the world around them. So Microsoft looked at all these phones that were outside of Microsoft, and they saw the way that all of them were, were helping and also beginning to hinder in similar ways, and they decided that they wanted to come up with a new kind of phone. So the inspiration, and this was inspiration both internally to Microsoft and inspiration outside of Microsoft, inspiration that came from histories of graphic design as well as things that had just been created in the last couple of years, uh, was if you're not going to match pixels from the templates when you're designing on the phone as a product, uh, spend more time with the inspiration than just with the specs. It's very easy to pull up in a spec document and just sort of measure out pixels and do that. But if you're kind of trying to create a product that's uniquely yours, that has your brand and style, spend a lot of time with the inspiration. Use a creative brief, or at minimum, create some mood boards. You saw those earlier on when I had kind of the wayfinding graphics all spread out across the screen. Create some of your own. Go out and take pictures. Put all the different pieces together. Create color swatches. It'll be worth your time. And then spend time consuming before you spend time creating. Now, I am a creator. I'm very passionate about creation. I helped create the phone. Uh, I created a family. I'm a teacher that helps people create. And I created a company recently. But at the same time, I always give creators this advice. There's always somebody out there that you can learn from. If you're going to work on a great mobile app, look at some of the inspiration that's out there in the world around you. One of the things that I, quotes that I love is from Jim Jarmusch. He's a, a director that cr created the movie Coffee and Cigarettes. He says this, nothing is original, still from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. And this is the part I love. Originality is non-existent. And don't bother concealing your thievery. Celebrate it if you feel like it. In any case, always remember what Jean-Luc Goddard said, it's not where you take things from, it's where you take them to. In the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the design principles. So I said in the last thing, influence and inspiration, creating in a vacuum isn't good, right? Uh, but neither is creating without boundaries. A lot of times the best design comes with limitations, and any medium has its limitations. These design principles that we created in the design studio became pillars or high bars that we would hold every single screen up against. They're very important in any application to, to make sure that you're measuring the quality of your application. We said this at first, Windows Phone design philosophy is exemplified by clean, uncluttered app screens that operate quickly, minimize typing, and surface new information automatically. Interactions happen directly with content, and visual elements have great fit and finish. Uh, you have the opportunity to use the phone for what it's best suited for, apps for the mobile lifestyle. The principles in this section will help you re realize your unique contributions to the Windows Phone platform. The four, five I'll be talking about today is pride and craftsmanship, more with less, fast and fluid, and authentically digital, win is one. Pride and craftsmanship. Devote time and energy to small things that many will see often. Engineer the experience to be completed, complete and polished at every stage. This is one thing I can't pound home enough. If your application is a hit, or if your OS is a hit, people will be seeing it over and over and over throughout the day. If you designed the start screen for Windows Phone, millions of users will be put using it on a daily basis. Or if you designed a little app that takes photos and adds them up to a, the cloud, some you might get a large market base and people will be using it over and over. The small frustrations in it will become big frustrations to them. Think about every single detail of the phone. One of the quotes that I love about Windows Phone says this, it feels alive, everything bounces, everything swoops, Everything flips. Every single action is lushly animated. And of course, my favorite part, it doesn't just sweat the details, blood was spilt. 
I love all the little details about Windows Phone, but the thing that makes me proud about this quote is that Gizmodo actually saw it when they, they were writing a review on the device. They said they took time to dedicate it to the details. Here's a couple of craftsmanship's how-to. One, I mentioned the grid earlier in a design presentation. Uh, get on the grid. The grid is the glue that gives your content the cohesion it needs. So it lays it out, and it is by far the, the easiest way to create order, which feels like simplicity to the user. Another one is use hierarchy and balance when designing your apps. Good use of typography can create a sense of structure and rhythm in your app's interface. Here's an example of good hierarchy and balance. Here's an example of bad hierarchy. Everything's completely left aligned. Every, the page doesn't feel evenly weighted. And there's a nice, simple rule when you're approaching hierarchy. Use a rule of thirds. You'll hear this a lot in design, but basically splitting up your content into three different sections so that the human eye can absorb it really easily. Any more than that, it gets, become, becomes confusing to the user. Another thing that I'd like to mention about craftsmanship when you're designing your own apps, don't forget who you are. Uh, find the typ typography that best reflects your app's personality. Here's a couple of great examples of this. The New York Times, right? This is beautiful. This is their typography. It feels very much like their brand, but it still feels like a part of the Windows Phone application. The next thing I'd like to talk about is less, more with less. Create a clean and purposeful experience by leaving only the most relevant elements on screen. When it comes to designing great apps and experiences, we believe in content, not Chrome. Uh, focusing on the content and not the Chrome elements allows your app content to shine. So one of the things that is very easy to do when creating an application is do a lot of adorning elements. And that's what we refer to as Chrome. Uh, it's a simple way as a designer, especially most of the applications out there are driven by content now. If you don't have the content yet and you're just sitting in Photoshop, it's sometimes hard to just say, this is what it will look like with content. And so what you end up doing is making a lot of adorning elements. If you, you actually take the content over the Chrome, by removing that Chrome and taking advantage of the font and the scale and the color, um, it will be much more legible and easy to read from the user. And then the last thing is, let your content breathe. This is called white space in the design world, and this is just putting uh, basically space around your most important content. Relevant content commands uh, and functionality are apparent and easy to interact with. Uh, a lot of times, as designers or app creators, it's very difficult to remove features to create that space around important elements. The one thing that I'd like to say about white space is the ultimate wasted space is not white space, but over cluttered space where everything just feels of equal importance. And that's never true in a good application. Fast and fluid. Products that feel immersive and responsive are compelling, delightful, and bring the interface to life. Let people interact directly with content and respond to actions quickly with matching energy. Bring life to the experience, create a sense of continuity, and tell a story through, through meaningful use of motion. Be alive. So this is my fluid how-to. Live tiles are responsive, alive, and engaging. Uh, one of the cues that we took in the design studio was from broadcast graphics, seeing how it would constantly felt relevant and up-to-date, and you never really felt bored with the content. But it wasn't just animating for animating's sake. It was actually showing you new things when new things didn't were relevant to show on the screen. Don't just animate for the purpose of animation. This is going back to the original thing I was talking about. It might be one of those things that becomes frustrating if it just plays over and over again. Uh, fluid how-to. Just motion. Help people learn how your app's interface works. One of the things that we learned in the design studio is that you can use motion to give a hint to the users that there are actual different functions on different items. One of the motions that we, you see commonly on Windows Phone is something called turnstile feather, where you see all the animate, uh, items animate in differently on a list at different times. It basically shows to the user that these are all individual hit targets, and they can hit them all separately and get different results from the list. Authentically digital. It sounds a little bit corny to say something is authentically digital, but this is something that Microsoft very much believes in. It's basically saying it's all about not being what we're not, <laughs> which basically means if we are a calendar app, we don't need to look like a physical calendar in the real world. We need to get you the data that's most relevant to you at the time, right? And a couple rules for digital how-to. 
use uh, iconographics or I infographics. Um, iconographics are kind of this old style icons, which um, if you look at, they do make sense and you can figure out what they're doing. Like here's a calculator, but you can look just as easily at this camera and see in a simple version of the camera what it applies to. It also applies to a lot broader range of, of uh, cameras because if you were to use an actual physical picture of a camera, the user may assume that that only applies to cameras that look like that or are similar to that. Uh, when is one? Using a common UI model and ecosystem creates complete end-to-end -end user scenarios. In other words, try not to reinvent the wheel. Innovation is great, but not at the expense of the user experience. Windows uh, isn't just a phone. Not only does it have Xbox, Office, Bing, Outlook, SkyDrive, and pieces of Windows on the mobile phone, but all these platforms are available for some form of development and creation across. So think platform when you're creating a Windows phone app. Uh, consider how your app will work across these factors and users and scenarios and the fact that you could have this application not only in the palm of your hand but in a tablet or on a laptop on your lap or maybe even on your media center or Xbox screen in your living room. And that wraps up sort of the design principles that I was talking about. Pride and craftsmanship, more with less, fast and fluid UI, uh, authentically digital, and win as one. Hi, I'm Jared Potter, and we're talking about w designing for Windows Phone 101. The topic right now is the design-driven product. In that, we're going to be talking about three different sections. The tools for a design-driven product, the process, and the team. This will apply not only to some of my experiences on the Windows Phone design team, but also to your individual experiences creating your own applications and software. Uh, the biggest dilemma, obviously, as a designer when you're creating these comps, is handing off the, the uh, ultimate vision that you have at the beginning to be created in a different medium. So I have these slides to illustrate. Maybe you have a design, and this is your masterpiece that you've worked on, and it's an egg, right? Uh, and you comp it up, and you spend a lot of time, and you redline it, and you put specs, and you say this egg is 18 pixels across, and then you hand it off as a PSD for the developer to create. And at a certain point, that developer or programmer or whoever's working on your team, maybe it's even you yourself, have to create it in a completely different platform. Maybe that's HTML, CSS, or maybe some other form of markup language. Um, and maybe it's XAML on the Windows phone. And the dev takes that code and they do their work to it and at some point it sort of loses the original intent. And of course you can't ship like that, so you put the content back together and you ship a som somewhat close to the original vision of your product. But the main dilemma is that your masterpiece that you worked so hard on has to be created by someone else, or maybe not, but in a completely different medium with totally different tools. Where you were in Photoshop, it needed to be created somewhere else. So one of the things about making it real is sort of taking it from that wireframe or that visual stage and getting it to that polished, beautiful piece uh, that everyone's going to come to know and love with the final product. One of the things that I like to say about this is just know your platform, right? Uh, we could never have a print team uh, where no one back in the day uh, understood four color print process or cardstock thickness or any of these different things. A lot of times now UX designers come to a product and they don't put the time and the effort to know anything about the platform they're working on. Uh, it, the best thing and the best experiences are when designers know what the limitations and the benefits that they'll get from their platform. So a couple of tools, tools how to. Know your platform. Designers, learn the benefits and limitations of your platform and work towards those. Try to make designs that are going to come out the best based on your, if, whether it be mobile or tablet, uh, kind of uh, experiences. Developers, Learn the design language. The more that you know and contribute to the design, the more it gives you the vocabulary that allows you to communicate. So the last point is just communicate between all the different people on the team and the different hats that need to be worn to create a great product. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the process. So the process when creating a big project like this can easily be an engineering or a data-driven project. And that's all great, and that's fine. Uh, but a lot of times along the ways, 
you'll get really focused on the implementation of something and less on the planning of the goals. You'll get, fo get a lot of hacks that you'll have to do at the 11th hour because you've only focused on the experience or the technology and you haven't really thought about the experience and have to sort of recreate the experience at the last minute. It will help you seize opportunities and at, and at a minimum, thinking about the design up front will allow you some room for innovation. In the design studio, we had a poster that looked like this. It says, explore, which is sort of the planning phase, concept, which is sort of the interaction design of an application, refine that design down, which is the visual phase of the project, commit, which is basically specking it out, or what we call redlining in the industry, realizing, which is, of course, building, making it work, um, and then verify, which is sometimes the most painful part to a designer, but double checking all your screens and re looking at it and everything. And then in game, which is celebrating, of course, what great stuff that's gone on. So, in the process, when you're thinking big, brainstorming, and brainstorming uh, in a design studio or brainstorming even with developers and designers, no idea is a bad idea, right? I don't know if you've participated in brainstorming, but it's a good idea to just throw all the pieces out there. There's a couple different ways that we do this. Sometimes it's with sticky notes. Everybody writes an idea and they stick it on the board. And then you begin to start taking all of those and putting them in categories and start category categorizing all the different ideas. But the main point is at the very beginning of a product, go big. Think of all your different options. Don't narrow yourself down until you've gotten to the point where you're actually committing to stuff. So, uh, how to go big, set a timeline, explore in concept, so as long as you have a timeline to work within, you'll know when to stop that sort of going big piece of it, um, and go big before you contract and sort of pull the different pieces in. The next phase is the information architecture. Uh, when you're looking at the information architecture, make sure that you're starting to put all those different pieces, or if you will, all the sticky notes that you just put on the whiteboard in the right category and saying, when I go to this screen, this is what screen I'd like to go. And this begins to make sense. It's a really great way to start putting all of your concepts in a coherent thought process. Working on that, the next step is interaction, and it's basically a big portion of the information architecture. The only difference between interaction design and sort of the information architecture is when you begin to actually put content or wireframes out on the screen. The next step in that is sort of, well, here, let me start with a couple of refined how-tos or best practices. Uh, establish your goals and principles really early on. So when you've got sort of over that big, go big, and coming up with lots of creative ideas, make sure that you establish a couple of the rules, similar to what we saw earlier on of kind of design principles that were used on Windows Phone or in the studio. Come up with those, just so you have something to gauge your designs against. Uh, storyboard out your ideas. This is similar to something they do in film, but kind of just take all your ideas from concept to reality and saying, okay, so-and-so is going to use this app. They may need to use it on a bus, and here's the different scenarios. One of the things that I really like to do is create a UI map, seeing how all the screens flow down together. Um, and the most important thing, establish an interaction model. This interaction model needs to be consistent for the user not to get lost in your application. Next is visuals. This is the part that you learn in school. This is the part that you work the most on. I won't give you too much guidance on this because I don't have your application in front of you to give feedback on. I'd love to do that, by the way. Um, but it's basically when you come and take that app and polish it up and pretty it up and make it look beautiful. And the last step, this is something I was in charge of in the design studio, is prototype. This is the stage that your app comes alive and all your hard work is put to the test. When prototyping areas of your app, take the time to sculpt and refine the components that need it the most. One of the things that I like to say about this is do it by any means necessary. Do it with a pad and pen, do it with a camera, but do it in such a way that people can see your concept rather than just hear you talk about the concept. It allows for a much more visual way and it sells your idea in a, in a much uh, more uh, relevant kind of way. So a couple of prototype how-tos. Here's a couple of links. If you just search, uh, do a Bing search, you can do screen design templates for Windows Phone. And these are a bunch of default templates that are provided for Windows Phone. They come in really handy. And then Sketchflow, which is a great blend tool for allowing you to quickly create a bunch of comps on screen, string them all together, and allow you to create hit targets so you bounce through from button to button and actually see all the different screens. In the design studio, we used a poster that looked like this. And it basically talked through the different phases of this. You have wireframes. Uh, that start out pretty early on. And then you have final visual comps. And look at this, this is mostly in Photoshop or some other program similar. 
You create some red lines, which is specking, meaning the de developer will know how high or how, uh, what the actual dimensions of that screen is. You do a little dev coding, of course. And then one of the things that we always did in the design studio is design integration. My, lead, my title was design integration lead. We always revisited every single one of those screens and went back and made sure that they were pixel perfect. And this is the blood, sweat, and tears phase that I, uh, uh, I love. And then, of course, there's always the test and validation to make sure your code works. So a couple of commit how-tos. Um, apply final visuals and motion treatment. Of course, don't leave that stuff out. Fold in early learnings from usability tests. Things that you learned early on, kind of that hunches, the creative hunches, the things that I was talking about that was like, use common sense. Using common sense sort of gets difficult in this phase, so don't forget to come back to it. Uh, fix bugs, interaction, visual motion, and functional. And most importantly, just know with your application to create a user journey. Know your user. I mentioned this earlier. Make it personal, have relevant content, and let them be present in the application. It's very important that the application and the story that you're telling uh, has to do, and the final goal is really going back into that user's pocket. So a couple of process how-tos. Don't lose track of the vision in the day-to-day -day schedule. It's very easy when you're working on a big project or you've worked on an app for months, weeks, maybe even years, to lose track of the big vision. Always go back to sort of that big timeline and wire your app and what stage you're in. Also, don't skip on the more, more boring steps. As a designer, going back, like verifying all of your screens and making sure that they look the visual polish that you wanted to at the very beginning, that gets daunting. It gets exhausting. But don't forget to do that. Always be sure to come back to those pieces. The last thing that I like to talk about is the team. And for you, this may be a very large team. For you, this may just be you wearing multiple hats. One day you're the designer, the next day you're the developer, and you switch through it. But ultimately, uh, the design skills that you'll see in a design studio look something like this. You'll have visual design, and it overlaps a little bit with interaction design. It, there's motion designers out there, and in the design studio at Microsoft, there's a full set of skills and job requirements around motion design. There's an information architect, and they put all the different pieces in the right places. Some people wrap this up in the whole user interface designer bubble. And there's, of course, the user experience designer. But basically, there's a lot of different hat hats that people will wear. There's identity designers and customer service managers and user experience designers. But the main thing is you may be working with a large team. You may be having to deal with a lot of different skill sets and work on a lot of different individual pieces. When I first started in mobile studio, out in Pioneer Square in Seattle, there was, I, I believe, like 12, 14 people on the team. And when I left the organization at Microsoft, there was maybe 1,800 people on the mobile team at Microsoft. Uh, the design studio, and this is a talk that I like, um, that Mike Krusininski, uh, one of the creative directors for Windows Phone, talked about in a talk called uh, Poetry and Polemix. And he talks about trying to get your idea across to a larger organization. And this little dot represents a beautiful idea that you have. And I loved this presentation. And he says, and you may have to spread that idea out to a UX design lead, a motion lead, a PM manager, UX PM. This may be different roles depending on the company that you're at. And then you have to communicate this vision out to a whole bunch of different people. Maybe this is project manager leads or development leads or programmers. Uh, and then that goes out to all the different people who are sitting your app out. And at some point in the process, your original idea gets gobbled up. The big thing is to become a good storyteller, a storyteller that sort of crosses all these different skill sets and boundaries so that they can understand what your original goal and intent was with that idea. Uh, he also used this example in his presentation, um, big, full, and fruity. These aren't words that describe a person or anything. This is more words that describe uh, a wine. And so it's like from the book Gary Wolf, The Quantified Self, he talks about going and take, doing wine testing. And they were asked to use the words big, full, fruity, all these different words to describe the wines. And he said, well, why do I have to use these words to describe the wine? And the, the instructor basically said to him, you're being asked to remember these wines. These adjectives are your labels. You're welcome to make up your own, but then I can't instruct you and nobody will understand you. When you're working with a big team on design, learn to speak the same language. It's very important that you have the same nomenclature. In the design studio, originally not all of the pieces that we're very familiar with with design uh, Windows design language actually had names, like tiles, didn't have names. Um, so it became very important for us to come up with names with that so that we knew what we were talking about when we were talking about different pieces. Become a good storyteller. Shoot a video. 
make storyboards, act it out if you have to, but tell the original goal of what you want your feature to be like. Prototype, show, don't just tell. So with, you can tell, so this first part's about telling, but prototyping and visually showing things off. There's been so many times I've worked on features for little apps or um, actually the OS where it felt like people were not on board with this feature. It felt like it was going to get cut. And as soon as we built a little prototype where we could show people what it would look like when they held it in their hands, the idea went straight to the top and everyone is, was excited about it. Um, and then of course, last but not least, it doesn't need to be said, respect others and their roles. Sometimes you work with people that do very different roles and have very different personalities than you. Try to respect them. That wraps up sort of the design-driven process and the section about how to create things that were led by design. Hi, I'm Jared Potter, and we're still talking about designing for Windows Phone 101. We've already talked through what is design, the Windows design language, and the design-driven process that we took to kind of create Windows Phone 8. And what is a good demo if we didn't actually show you some of the UI on the phone? So I'm going to take you through some of the examples and the inspiration, some of the things we talked about already. We're going to look at some of these samples on the phone, and in the next section, we're going to learn about how to create the composition, the visuals, and actually put your own apps and your own ideas onto the phone. So let's get started. First, I'm going to toggle over here to my emulator, and I'm going to turn on the screen, and the first thing that you're going to see is our beautiful lock screen. Now, one of the cool features for Windows Phone 8 is the fact that you can, as an application developer, override this background image uh, with your own graphic and uh, data. So this image area here in the background, one thing that you're going to want to note is that if you're going to put any text or graphics that aren't just kind of a full screen background image, you're going to want to kind of keep it up in this top corner, top left hand corner. I got to keep the screen alive and not let it die. There is kind of the clock and time area. Then there's definitely a status area right down here. And then there's going to be five slots along the bottom for you to put five different applications and their status. So these are alerts that if you miss an email, if you miss an SMS, it's going to pop up in that area and show you uh, what you've missed and get the user to move into it. So here we are on the new, beautiful, new and improved Windows Phone 8 start screen. You'll notice the live tiles um, go from edge of the screen to the edge of the screen. In the next section, we're going to talk about the grid and how we decided and defined and laid that stuff out. But one of the cool things that you'll notice is that there's still not that gap over on the right-hand side to find your app list, but it's still there. You can still move through this application, and if you want to, click the long list selector and jump on down to any single application. I'm going to jump on down to Groupon, make a selection, and then I'm going to pin that to my start screen over here. Now Groupon is a great example of the new and improved functionality of Windows Phone 8's live tiles. Over here it's going to flip and it gives me a little bit more data than I had before, but if I press and hold on that live tile, I can actually resize it down to the different sizes. There's small size, which just gives me the Groupon logo, nice and beautiful. If I press and hold on it and edit again and click it again, it's going to give me the large style. I'm going to style a uh, live tile. I'm going to leave it there and see if it gives me some more data. I believe it does, and it'll flip around and give me the next Groupon deal. There it is, $18 for a, uh, a class. So if I move up to the top here, I want to show you some of the controls that we're going to be talking about. We talked a little bit about the inspiration and typography involved in it, but I want you to see pivots and panoramas before I tell you how to use them. First, let's go into the people zone. This is a panorama, and the goal of a panorama is really to give you an overview, make you feel like a full spread magazine layout. I can move on this left to right or right to left, and it's basically cyclical. You can loop around, and on here I basically have everything that's personal and people uh, right in front of my eyes. Uh, in here we have something called Family Room, and this is a cool little UI that uh, allows you to see everything that is in one small group of friends. So over here I have friends room and my friends room just contains messages between me and the friends that are in that location. This is also a panorama and you'll notice the same sort of functionalities of panning left to right. One of the things to note when you're creating your own panoramas is this whole full screen background image that slides with it. You may want to think about doing that if you're programming your own, making that seem blend from left to right on the far left and right hand side. 
Now let's go back to our start screen and look at a couple other great examples of a panorama. Groupon, we just looked at, has a great panorama design on it. They've taken panorama and made it their own. They have their own custom header at the top, but yet the content is still all in a panorama. So moving from left to right and through these items, still have lists of content, but it's still beautiful. And they've taken our idea and our concept, our information architecture, and made it their own, completely unique to Groupon. We're going to go back to the live tile, and that's not the start screen, and that's not everything there is to the start screen. I know I wanted to show you the panoramas, but one more thing to add, you would be remiss to skip the theming that is built into Windows Phone 8. We've introduced more themes, and just like in Windows Phone 7, you can go light and dark theme, but now you can also pick out from a lot of different beautiful colors. We now have 20 built in, and based on your manufacturer, you may have even more than that. I'm going to go back to my start screen, and instantly it's like I have a new phone. Uh, this is so customized, and this layout with the different size live tiles and the way that you can sort and reorder these guys just by pressing and holding and moving these guys around from left to right, up and down, makes the, the start screen and the live tiles completely unique and completely yours. Another thing that I'd like to show you is a good example of contact and how Windows Phone pulls all the data from all the different services into one location. I'm going to go here to one of my contacts, one of my friends' cards, and look at, I basically have their data right here, but I also have their notifications, what's new, everything that's coming in from their social feeds, and then the ability to share. I'm going to come back and see if I can find a contact that I've been in contact with. Sometimes it's really frustrating to remember if somebody tweeted you or if somebody wrote you a Facebook message, somebody sent you an email or an SMS. On Windows Phone 8 and on Windows Phone 7, we made good use of the pivot. It's all the data about Eric, um, but as I pivot through these items, I can look at his photos, his history, and now taking all that data. Right now I only have two text messages. It's compiled it all into one location um, that shows the the profound strength that is all the data services and all the social feeds that come into Windows Phone 8. One of the other exciting features that I'd like to show to you that we're going to work a little bit and you can utilize in your own applications is lenses. So just like always, we have a camera button. And if I press that camera button, I will be able to look around the design studio. If I hit the reverse button, I'll be able to see myself. So you can see me there on the screen. Over here on the far left hand side, of my phone is now a button for the lenses. If I click the lenses button, it'll bring up an option of all the different applications that have written UI specifically for the lenses. I'm going to go to CamWow, and CamWow basically just runs some fun effects on the data that's coming out of the camera. I can choose between those different effects. Uh, we'll choose this one, and it makes my nose look huge. This is just one of the really cool features. There's also the ability to open up other media element that isn't coming directly off the, uh, the phone, or sorry, the camera data, but open it from the media, media library and manipulate that data too. It's just another great feature from Windows Phone. Now, I've got two kids, and I know this has been demoed a lot, but when you're creating applications, a lot of times you're creating applications and games that aren't just meant for adults. Uh, when you hand off your phone to a kid, they can mess it up or get into your personal email. One of the great features in Windows Phone, if you lock the screen and unlock it, you can have a pin lock on here, and just a simple swipe to the right allows you to get into Kids Corner. I unlock this, and only games and music that you've approved can go into the Kids Corner. Now some of the cool features like Customize that we've come to know and love on Windows Phone still exist in Kids Corner. And if I press the Home button to go back, it actually just shows uh, the um, default home screen for Kids Corner. It doesn't send you into the adult version of the phone. That's just a quick example of some of the cool new features that are coming into Windows Phone 8. There are different APIs that you can program against and different things that you can use your design skill to design against. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. I'll see you again in the next section. Hi, my name is Jared Potter and we're talking about designing for Windows Phone 8. Uh, in the previous section we talked a little bit about myself, uh, Jared Potter. I am the principal designer for 6F Studios. Before that I spent about three plus years designing on uh, as design integration lead in the mobile studio at Microsoft. If you have any questions about this you can always contact me at Jared T. Potter uh, on Twitter. 
Uh, in the previous sections, we talked about what is design, kind of the high-level principles behind design and why do we design. The next, we talked about Windows design language, formerly known as Metro, and some of the principles there. Next, we talked about the design-driven product and the process and creation of de a, a design-driven application. Next, we talked about some of Windows Phone 8's great features. Um, and now we'll be talking about the Windows 8 ecosystem, or Windows ecosystem, both for Windows Phone and Windows 8. Uh, most of you should know by now, Windows 8 uh, is sort of the next beautiful OS from Microsoft. Um, if you haven't seen anything about it, or if you don't already have it at home, um, you can notice that there's a lot of similarities with Windows Phone uh, as well as Windows 8. They're, they're very similar, but there's also some key differences that we'll need to talk about in this talk. One, you'll notice the live tiles. Both of these uh, Windows Phone and Windows 8 um, have live tiles that bubble up more relevant content to you when you first go to the start screen. These live tiles are very customizable on both OS's, right? The, the ability to drag and drop kind of the uh, live tiles in the correct area that you'd like them, as well as using colors, theme colors, and the ability to pin them makes this both OS's uniquely yours. Uh, hardware connection between the start button screen both on Windows Phone and Windows 8, allow you to just hit the Start button and you'll instantly be launched back into that Start Screen experience, which is the starting point for all major applications. One, there's also software connections on both platforms for sharing. Uh, on Windows Phone, you always have the ability to share out in unique ways. This would usually bubble up in the application bar. On Windows 8, you have the ability to gesture in some charms from the right-hand side of the screen. If you put your hand on the outside and pull in from the right-hand side of the screen, in addition to a Start button, you also get the ability to have sharing charms and a couple of other things like Search. If you click the Sharing Charm, you can share with different applications and over different APIs the content from that application. It's a great feature, and it's similar on both Windows Phone as well as Windows 8. Um, a couple of things that are a little bit different. Windows 8 has no hardware back button, where Windows Phone does have a hardware back button. One of the things that you'll need to note when you're working on a Windows 8 UI is that you'll need to include in the UI somewhere, and we have some great design specs about this, um, is the is a hardware or a sorry a, an interface or a button in the screen that's a back button rather than using the hardware back button. Uh, the Windows 8 search charm is contextual to the app. So on Windows 8, if you gesture in from the right-hand side again, and rather than sharing, you hit the search button, this will allow you to search that application that you're in. It's contextual to the app that you've either created or you're using at the time. On Windows Phone, if you hit the search button on the phone, it'll actually send you into the global Bing search. So that's two different things to note and two different things that you're going to have to think about when you're creating your application. Another thing is, on Windows 8, you can use a gesture to close an application. On Windows 8, if you drag from the top of the screen down to the bottom, it'll close the application. On win but with both Windows Phone and Windows 8, uh, the OS itself does smart multitasking, deciding which applications to close. So it's a little bit different on Windows Phone without the ability to do that sort of drag from the top to the bottom. Uh, next, things that you'll note is that you would like to have, if you really want to have your content alive everywhere, it's really important to the developer as well as the user to have their software on both a mobile and a PC experience. So if you are using the phone, it's usually because it's in your pocket and you're on the go. But if you're using sort of more of the uh, PC experience, it's usually because you're there and you want an in-depth look at the same type of content. Uh, one of the things to do, if you really want to reach a broader audience or maybe the same audience at different times in the day is to create the exact same application but do it one experience for the Windows Phone and the other one for Windows 8. Same audiences but sometimes it's just different times. Uh, another thing is it's a great opportunity just more uh, focused on the developer. One, you have that reach that I sort of mentioned in the last slide. You can reach more people. There's so many more people than just have phones, also have PCs. So you can just sort of broaden that whole global reach, right? The next is the experience. Windows style apps um, kind of share that experience across both Windows Phone as well as Windows 8. So if you want something that's really similar but yet a different context on your same content, create an app for Windows 8 as well as Windows Phone and uh, you'll get a nice challenge both 
when you reach out to that audience. Uh, next, some of the things that make it easier on you is some of the skills required, right? So Windows Phone and Windows 8 have a shared core. This is a very exciting thing for developers. It allows you to leverage the same skills across devices, right, or very similar skills. Um, it gives you very common tools and very common APIs when you're writing your code. Um, as well as the last thing is there's a lot of reusable code from one platform to the next. They're basically a very similar or the same platform, even though they're um, on two different experiences. So you'll get to reuse a lot of that code. Uh, one application that does all of this very nicely and creates a great experience, but a tailored experience on both devices is the Cocktail Flow app. This is created by a company called Distinction. You can find them at teamdistinction.com. They're in London as well as they have an office, I believe, in Budapest. Um, I got an opportunity about a week ago or a couple of weeks ago to talk to Girgay and his team about their experience creating this application. Now, Cocktail Flow is an application that allows you to create cocktails and other beverages, and it gives you instructions how to do this, you can search on them or just put in your ingredients and it will tell you what drinks that you can create. They have created this both for Windows Phone and Windows 8, um, and it was one of the first applications in both marketplaces as well as one of the highest ra app rated applications on Windows 8, on Windows Phone 8, sorry. Uh, one of the things you'll notice right when you dive into the application is sort of the differences and the similarities between the landing. The landing page on Windows 8 has the same type of drinks, buy drinks, you can look up uh, what you want to create or by color or different things. You have the same sort of content on Windows Phone 8, um, but it's in pivots. And we've talked about pivots. One of the unique differences between this and this is that this is sort of a grouped list. These are lists that wrap around and they have titles above them and you kind of just pan along horizontally. Uh, on Windows Phone 8, you're going to use pivots, which mean that you'll still pan left to right, but that's to switch context, basically by drink or by color. And then you'll pivot or, or scroll uh, vertically in order to see more information on that content. Um, and that's just the differences basically between a PC experience, sort of the much smaller mobile experience. So some of the similarities that you'll note between the two applications is their brand is consistent. If you want to create an application, make sure that you're not changing your brand for mobile or changing it for PC or whatever. Uh, the uh, Distinction team, when they created this, actually created it for iOS Android phones and tablets, as well as for Windows Phone and Windows 8. So they have a great experience of sort of taking uh, the similar context and their own brand and sort of spreading it out across multiple devices, but making sure that the experience is almost the exact same across platforms. Um, make sure that your content is the same. I noted this earlier, but one of the things that you'll note when you look at these applications, one of the first things that you'll point out is that they have great photography in their applications. The content that they pull in is uniquely theirs and it looks beautiful across their applications no matter what platform it is on. So don't worry too much about uh, the sort of aspect ratio or the size. Just have that same great content and the same great brand and it will be a uniquely your application. One of the things that they also have is instant search, the ability to quickly search. On Windows 8, they use the search charm on the right hand side. On Windows Phone, they either do an application bar or on a list that's up at the top of the application. One of the things that they do nicely is in both applications, it uses a different navigation model because it's a different device or a different uh, sort of interaction model, um, but they have the same navigation depth. It's basically the same amount of clicks to get from that landing page down into the content. So they use sort of the hub and spoke model that we talked about on Windows Phone, right? There's a landing page, and I already showed you the landing page of their application, that you come in and you kind of see the high level of where you can go and drill down into lots of different spokes, right? Um, they have a hub page, and then you can drill into a section page. Here's an example of a section page. On Windows Phone, these are usually lists, or actually on both of them, they are lists. And on Windows Phone, it's a vertical scrolling list that you can click at the top and search and filter through that list. On Windows 8, these are horizontally scrolling uh, lists, and you'll notice too uh, the back button up in the top left hand corner. And then of course after you go from the, the uh, hub pages down into the section pages, which we're looking at now, you go into the content pages. And this obviously in this application would be how to create a drink. Um, and these are usually like dead end type pages and all of them are sa the same. So this is, might be different for your application, but sort of try to use the same model if you're using a hub and spoke model of a landing page, sort of the sectional pages and then drilling down into dead ends or content type pages. 
Uh, they have the same functionality. Both of them use the bar stock, right? So on Windows Phone, they have the ability to use pivots, and you can select the drinks that you currently have in your home, and it will tell you what cocktails you'll make. On Windows 8, they have the same experience, but instead of being in pivots, they kind of have these pivot type headers that allow you to filter it, and then you scroll horizontally um, to go down the list instead of vertically to go down the list. Both are the exact same functionality. Both give you the cool opportunity to see what drinks you could currently make at that time, uh, but they're both done in uniquely Windows Phone and Windows 8 ways. Uh, next, so some of the system differences. So we've seen some of the similarities. The navigation slightly different. The obvious one, right, is uh, the back button, ability to actually hit the hardware back button or having to have a back button in your UI. Uh, list orientation. On Windows Phone, because it's, uh, if you're in portrait mode, those lists are always scrolling vertically. On Windows 8, those lists usually scroll left to right. Other thing is scale. You notice that there's always great, beautiful phot photography in the uh, uh, application. But if you look at the uh, desktop version, that photography is just scaled up and at a much higher resolution. It's just really a beautiful way to, to sort of highlight your same content on more of a, a PC experience or a larger scale experience. And then, of course, lastly, one of the key differences or system differences is the search, right? And I mentioned this earlier. In Windows 8, you're going to use the global or the uh, contextual search on the charm. On Windows Phone, you're going to need to build in the ability to do the search. Then there's a couple of delighters. I talked about this with Motion. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about lots of different ways to do delighters, even as we enter the next section of our talk. But they do it in a unique way on both platforms. On Windows 8, if you're scrolling through a list of drinks, pardon me, like this, uh, and you click on any of those drinks, all the other drinks sort of animate away very nicely, and all the ingredients just animate in. This is a beautiful way to kind of add a delighter and an exciting way to enter into your content or enter into another page. On Windows Phone, that's not as available. So instead, when you click on a list of drinks, the drinks all sort of animate into place similar to how these ingredients animate in from the bottom. But on a phone, you always have the accelerometer data or kind of how you're holding and tilting that phone. On Windows Phone, if you tilt that phone back and forth left to right, the drinks and the content slide left to right kind of in a parallax motion, giving it some depth and some excitement when you're interacting in it. Both are really fun experiences, very subtle experiences when you're interacting with their, with their application, but it adds that extra delighter that makes that application feel so professional, so polished, and it delights you so that you want to return to it and share it with others. Cocktail Flow is available in both marketplaces. If you want to look, out, look at what I'm talking about, go ahead and go and download it today. Um, a couple of things that I'd like to point out that they did really nicely and kind of I would recommend for all of your Windows Phone and Windows 8 applications if you're developing across the whole Windows ecosystem is four things. Use the entire ecosystem to meet your customers in more places, right? You get some of the marketplace on a PC, you get some of the marketplace on a mobile phone, but if you hit both, you're, you're guaranteed a much broader, more diverse um, customer base, essentially. Uh, number two, be consistent with your brand and content. Just because you're going from a PC to a mobile phone doesn't mean you're any different or that your application needs to be any different. One of the key mistakes that people use sometimes when they're moving from a desktop application or a tablet application down to a mobile is they'll cut features out like crazy. You've seen how on Cocktail Flow, they've basically been able to pull off the same features but in just sort of a different scale using different sort of interactions. Number three, embrace the differences. Embrace the way that search works on one. Embrace the way that search works on the other. Instead of forcing the Windows 8 version to have a hardware search button just because phone has a hardware search button, embrace the global search because people who are always on that platform have become used to using that search specifically, similar with the back button. Uh, create, uh, the last thing I'd like to point out is to create unique delighters on all platforms, right? So you have the exact same content, you have the exact same brand, but you have the opportunity because either you have a PC and a tablet version or maybe a more of a desktop kind of traditional way, um, and then on the phone it's going to be in your pocket. Just figure out what ways are best going to delight and showcase that brand and that content. And the Cocktail Flow app does that nicely. I hope that you figure out unique ways. A lot of times that's with motion in your applications, um, but try to find the unique delighters on all platforms. Uh, 
I'm Jared Potter, and this has been Designing for Windows Phone 8. A couple of the thank yous that I'd like to shout out is for Megan Donahue and Ryan Bickle, who did some great Metro slides back in the day. Robbie Inkerbretson, who's done a couple of talks on uh, design fundamentals for developers that highly influenced the What is Design section. Karina Black and Arturo Toledo, who's done Windows Phone design slides for a long time. Segal in the design studio, the design lead that reviewed this content. Mike Krasinski's Ptolemy and Politics slides, as well as Jason Gordon and HTC for donating Windows phones. Thank you very much. Um, and you can always contact me on Twitter at Jared T. Potter. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.